Awesome. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to Higher and More Speaker Series. And during this speaker series, we get to know these stories of religious and nonprofit leaders and the amazing work of their organizations. Before beginning our conversation today, we just want to briefly introduce Higher Words and our guest speaker's background. Higher Words is a startup based in Silicon Valley that gives community focused organizations the ability to provide members with a credit card branded with the organization's logo. Essentially, each time the members use the card, they support the organization financially because 2% of their daily transactions goes directly towards the organization. My name is Sri, and I'm a business intern for Higher Words this summer. My name is Mihir Nair, and I'm also a business intern with Higher Words this summer. Along with Sri, we'll be co-hosts for this amazing conversation. Last but not least, we would love to extend a warm welcome to today's guest speaker, Mr. Paul Thibault. Paul is the founder of Thibault Method, a nonprofit organization based in the Bay Area. Yeah, just um, first of all, welcome, Paul. And just to start off, can you tell us a little bit more about your background, your experience serving others, and your work at Thibault Method? Sure. Uh, they're all pretty much tied in uh, since I, I'm going to be 40 this year. Um, I read my first book when I was 23. It was, it was Malcolm X's autobiography. And um, the, the, it was a life-changing moment for me because up until that point, I didn't really um, have aspirations or, or know where I was going. I, I had dropped out of school. Um, I had struggled severely in school. Uh, I had uh, run the streets and uh, had a lot of had a lot of run-ins with uh, with a life of poverty. So um, when I read Malcolm X's book, I was blown away by his intrinsic motivation to change his life and and how someone can become so motivated that they can change the entire way they think, the decisions they make, and the actions that they take and go from a lost soul in prison, Malcolm was, to one of the most historical black leaders to ever live in this country. Um, so that was kind of where Tebow Method started. The work I, um, um, I do started in, in how we serve people. Um, fast track that to starting Tebow Method in 2009. Uh, the goal of the nonprofit is to connect low-income students with their passions, or what are more formally known as interests. Um, and we work with high poverty students. So those are students that live in school systems with predominantly low-income um, student populations. And they are the most likely to fail, the most likely to drop out, and the most likely to repeat the cycle of poverty. Our goal at Tebow Method is to uh, turn children's lives around um, by giving them the ability to succeed academically and in life, uh, but through a little bit of an un untraditional method, um, yet very well researched, which is to uh, connect them with what they are interested in learning about. And by doing so, children's minds begin to activate and they begin to see learning as something that is fun instead of something that is undesirable or a reflection of their low achievement. They also begin to build a lot of confidence in themselves. Um, and finally, they begin to develop a lot of the skills that are needed in school to be academically successful. So in the last eight years, we've served over a thousand students. We've recruited and paired more than a thousand volunteers with students. Um, and um, our results kind of speak for themselves. Um, typically, a student will come into our program from kindergarten to eighth grade, uh, one to four years behind. Um, and it takes on average for them, uh, you know, six months to catch up almost to grade level. Um, and it happens by us tapping into what they're passionate about, which can be dogs, uh, tanks, cartoons, video games, wanting to be a doctor, wanting to be a DJ, um, wanting to um, start your own business. Basically, anything that interests a learner, we have the curriculum to help them learn through what are called passion projects. 
um, how to pursue those interests, and at the same time, develop the skills that help them to um, become successful in school and feel good about themselves, which I think is as important as doing well in school, is feeling good about yourself. Yeah, thank you for that insightful response. I think Sri and I and the entire team at Higher Words truly appreciate you coming on to speak not only about the work you're doing, but you know, the inspiration for your own life to kind of found this, get it kickstarted in 09 and now have it, you know, have this network of thousands of students, thousands of volunteers giving back to the students and allowing these students to develop such important skills that will truly last a lifetime, such as, you know, building their self-confidence, finding that passion project to kind of explore it further, maybe gain it, gain an outlet for creativity, or just, you know, find like a comfort, comforting, you know, pet and like an animal. You know, there's so many different um, ways that passion projects truly help students grow and learn and connect with others. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. And, you know, just going off of um, what you talked about at the very beginning, um, you talked about that book with Malcolm X and, you know, how something very close to your own heart is how you were able to overcome poverty by pursuing your own passions and by reading that book. Um, and that's why um, the Tebow method and you yourself strive to currently provide free learning opportunities to, you know, so many children by specifically cultivating these passions through these passion projects. However, unfortunately, due to COVID-19, um, spending time with the children and, you know, creating their success stories has undoubtedly become more difficult with social distancing, distancing protocols and, you know, other public health regulations. Um, so how has Tebow method continued? Um, to, you know, uplift students despite COVID-19? Um, well, things were going great when, when COVID hit in March. Um, we this year planned on enrolling 200 students and we're well on our way toward achieving that goal um, when, when COVID closed down the schools. Um, it has been um, just a, a, a whirlwind of tsunamis and tornadoes to try to problem solve how to, how to cope with something um, so, uh, so widespread and, and so severe. Um, the, uh, our local school system and school systems like ours um, um, have been struggling to implement distance learning. Um, technology issues that uh, lower income kids have at home, preventing them from getting online in the first place, to spotty internet connections. Um, and then when you couple that with um, a lot of uh, the, uh, the inability of parents to uh, be full-time teachers at home on top of full-time caretakers and not always having the financial resources to buy online tutoring or buy educational apps um, extra educational enrichment um, services that children can um, supplement the lack of learning at school with, um, you end up with um, what we might call COVID generation. And uh, that's a doubling of poverty over the coming 15, 20 years as children in our school district are left permanently behind. Um, I should say that in our school system and school systems like ours, kids are about two to three years behind by eighth grade. And up to 75%, 70 or 25, um, 7, 25% of kids end up uh, dropping out and less than 12% ever make it to college. Um, so adding COVID on top of that um, just puts them at risk to be permanently behind. So kind of getting to your question, what do we do? Um, well, um, three aspects of our program model are problem solving, understanding, and improvement. And um, <clears throat> in, in line with our program model, what we saw COVID as is an opportunity to problem solve, to understand, and to improve our model. So um, we moved into a, a model, uh, we're moved, we've moved into an online model. And um, what we've done is, and are doing, is putting volunteers online with students over Zoom so that they can uh, connect and work on passion projects um, despite not being able to meet in person. Um, our school system is distance learning through the rest of the year, and there's a high probability that it'll only move to hybrid 
which is part, part in-person, part online for the rest of the school year. So we need to adapt to that. And um, our goal over the next eight months is to enroll 500 Ravenswood students in our online program and build the IT infrastructure needed to start sharing our model with other school systems that are similarly um, affected like Ravenswood District. And I'll just close with um, when schools return, the problem probably worsens, not alleviates. Um, you're going to have um, students coming back, you know, two, three years behind and having a lot of different needs into school systems that are not resourced to be able to deal with that much differentiated need. Um, it's going to take probably through the 2021 school year for lower income school systems to get back to normal. So what we have thought is two years ahead and if we can put our program online and we can begin to share it with other school systems, then at the very least we can slow the learning loss and we can give more students access to the thing that research shows gives you college and life goals to begin with, which is your interests. And this is something that we think uh, can be um, a, a support mechanism for school systems um, near and far over the coming years. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I think we all here appreciate you speaking so honestly about how it's so much harder to enrich the educational experience of children, especially during this um, this unprecedented time and with this like new COVID generation, as you mentioned, because so many students um, have been like left behind like, in terms of like societal um, obligations and like the societal norms, they've kind of been left behind and forgotten. However, it's also so inspiring to hear about how you can improve your model that centers around student learning and student empowerment and um, focus where so like shift the focus to how um, students and volunteers can readily work together on passion projects in a virtual environment as well. And um, the Thibaut uh, Tiro method um, basically guides its work by five separate principles. And these include learning about how, um, about things that you love more and, and searching for a fit between what you love and what you're good at, as well as applying what you learn in the real world and focusing on getting better and not being right, as well as finally being who you are and not what others want you to be. Of these five guiding ideas, which one do you feel is more important to the work of your nonprofit and why? Uh, certainly the first one. Um, I don't know if it's chronologically uh, ordered to be most to least important, but um, certainly number one, um, doing what you love. So our logo is a, is a, brain, is a brain heart and um, we chose that as a logo because we think that to uh, live with purpose and meaning and to also live up to your potential, uh, you need to use both your passions and your, your intellect, your creativity. So, um, and to do so starts with loving something. So the research on pursuing interests or interest-based education uh, is really clear um, at all grade levels and all socioeconomic levels that when kids pursue their interests, they do better academically. They also have higher levels of emotional fulfillment. So they don't get as anxious as often. They um, enjoy the time that they spend um, learning more in general. Um, and um, they tend to become more creative and more exploratory and more open-minded. So unfortunately in low-income school systems, um, prioritizing interests is um, usually not near even the top 10 things that are priorities because schools have to worry about testing scores being closed down. Um, they have to worry about hungry children. They have to worry about safe homes. So higher poverty school systems have so much to deal with already just with health and wellness and basic education that passions are relegated um, uh, usually to the end of the line, which never makes it to the front. Um, so um, we believe loving, learning to love what you do is the most important. Um, and to 
to give you an example of kind of how students learn to love or discover what they love, this is a, um, that is a monster truck. Uh, it may not look like one to you, uh, but it is a monster truck. One of our learners loves monster trucks. And so what we, uh, this is his second iteration actually. He started off by making a cardboard one that you could only like put around your hip and walk with, kind of like a costume. And then we challenged him to make one that a kid can sit in. So he was watching videos, he had to get help reading, and he learned engineering and mathematics skills, and he built a, uh, uh, a monster truck that you can sit in. I won't fully sit in it because I'm not sure if it can support my weight. Um, but he built this monster truck. And at the same time of, uh, as pursuing a passion, he is learning a lot of the skills that you need to um, succeed in school. And not only that, um, he's starting to realize that he has a, a, an intense interest in, in building and engineering, something that he had no idea that he was motivated by or had talent at. That, by the way, that is done by a third grader. And then one more example would be um, a girl who just loves dogs and wants to help people. And so we introduced her to the Humane Society website for the first time. She had never heard about it. And she had to do a lot of reading and research and created a presentation about helping dogs. And now, not only has she uh, created a presentation, but she is working with one of our volunteers to make a flyer that she can put up around the community to tell people where they can call if they find lost dogs. And Again, this was something that she um, had no idea that she was interested in or that she um, had a talent for. So um, we, by far, by far, um, helping children to connect with what they love would be the top principle in tree building. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing, for literally sharing two of uh, the passion projects. Um, going back to the first one, the little toy truck, um, even at, as a college student myself, I don't think I could build that. So um, it's honestly inspiring to hear how, um, you know, the students you serve are taking the initiative with the guidance and mentorship of volunteers who have experience um, to kind of pursue their passions and gain an interest in engineering and designing or gain an interest in, you know, creating that helpline to help um, pets and animals and, you know, work with the Humane Society. I think the work you're doing is clearly having an impact on students. And I'm sure that's exactly what you as the founder would ever, you know, it's more than you could ever dream of happening. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. And, you know, what I ever dream of actually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, of course, you know, your work is so inspiring to all of us and, Thank you so much for sharing that. And I guess just going off of that, um, besides the two student projects you just showed us, um, your nonprofit organization has already provided book donations, preschool story times, home tutoring, center-based tutoring, online tutoring, and after-school programming for underserved pre-K um, pre to eighth grade students with the support of more than a thousand volunteers. So through all of this excellent work and service, what is one particular moment or story that kind of uh, sticks out to you among the rest? Wow, it's hard. Um, I'm gonna sneak a quick one in and then tell you the, the, the one. Uh, so 0 0.1 or zero is um, a, a fifth grader who came into our program and um, struggled to even um, have the intellectual energy to have a conversation. Um, when we uh, could not read, could not write. Um, so we realized we needed to just talk to him and and teach him how to talk. Um, so we realized that he loved video games, Fortnite, and um, through playing Fortnite and having him talk about what he likes about it has started to teach him how to become a better verbal communicator and translate his ideas into words. Um, and we were really excited to see him do his first Google spreadsheet ever um, to make a list of the part of the scenes from Fortnite that he liked. Um, so that's my little one. The, the, the big one, because what a lot of people look for, like test scores and show me how they, you've transformed them in school. 
Um, so we have those two. Uh, so we had a boy in first grade come into our program and was failing. And the school had told the parent that she needed to put him back into kindergarten because they did not have the resources to help him catch up. And the only option was to put him back into kindergarten so that he could be at grade level with his peers. Um, the mo mother called us crying, um, not knowing what to do. And, and we, we, we boldly, I'll say it, we boldly told her, enroll him in Tebow Method and he will catch up. Um, she trusted us, she enrolled him in our program. And the morning after his first day in our after, after school program, she said that for the first time all school year, he was motivated to go to school. By the end of the week, he was waking up early to make sure everyone was ready to leave for school. And the teacher said that she had noticed a change in his attitude and his participation what we had, what we, what we had discovered is that he loves drawing. And actually, as well just show you him, part of his drawing. So this is a first grader's freehand drawing. He is just freehanding, looking at what he sees, and then drawing. And not to, not to, to uh, take away from his work, but this is not even his best work. Um, so by focusing on drawing, um, he began to be more, will, more excited to go into school and more willing to listen to the teachers and more willing to learn how to read books that were about drawing and uh, read websites that were about drawing and talk about things that were about drawing. And over the course of four months, um, he caught up. And his teacher, who has been teaching for 25 years, said that she has never seen a student learn that fast. Um, her mom um, had, as actually it gets better. Her mom is actually um, volunteers with us now, helping us. And um, she ha she has discovered one of her son's gifts, which is drawing. And um, he has discovered something that we hope will uh, he'll pursue over the course of his life because he loves it and he's good at it. And um, to top it all off, he uh, he's doing well in school. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I think I the entire time that you were speaking, I was just smiling ear to ear. I think it's so great to see how um, how your how um, the Tivo method and your way of educating and how you choose to educate all these young people. Um, it's such a unique way. Um, it's like kind of like not deviating from traditional education, but kind of using everyday life and using everyday resources to educate. And um, I only wish that I had these amazing um, resources growing up. I think when you were talking about how um, you guys use Fortnite to educate and improve a child's verbal communication skills, um, as well as kind of transform their educational experience and have it be something that is greater than like sitting and writing on a piece of paper and like taking tests. So I think it's so, I think it's so rewarding to see an organization kind of transform how, um, how students and young people are learning today as well. And um, it's so great to see how the world of Tebow Method is truly, truly unique and um, so one of a kind, as well as exceptional in the way that it empowers students mm -hmm. and um, allows students to like fully grow and un like, unlock their full potential as well. And with that being said, you know, like here at Fire Awards, we're all about uplifting and empowering those who have already dedicated their lives to others, um, such as yourself. And specifically, we're more about financially empowering um, with a promise of a 2% cashback. And um, as the Tebow Method sustains and grows its work for the future, what are some of the future financial challenges that you foresee? And um, how do you plan on overcoming these types of challenges? I think that uh, what, what we're looking to do here in the next um, year uh, is to, as I said earlier, um, 
pair 500 Ravenswood students with volunteers, which by the way, you guys should consider becoming a volunteer because you can volunteer from anywhere and we provide all the training for you. Um, so uh, that's one of our goals is to pair 500 Ravenswood students with, um, with volunteer and we call you cultivators, passion cultivators actually. Um, and then the second is to um, solidify an IT platform that can create a very efficient program structure, right? So it's easy to log in, it's easy to see your classes, it's easy to report your classes, it's easy to ask for help, it's easy to see your students' information, what their passions are, past projects they've done. What we're looking to do here um, in the next year is to um, connect with Silicon Valley companies who want to provide the capital and the software and the expertise to help us build that platform so that we can build a reliable IT, um, uh, uh, IT platform to support connecting volunteers with students and also to, to create a stable program model so that when we share it with other school systems, they can quickly get right to the mission which is to cultivate student passions and not have to um, um, fumble around with troubleshooting and figuring out how to make the technology work. So that's really our, our biggest uh, financial goal in the next year. Six months if you want to, to be a little bit more precise. Yeah, it's great to hear about how you, you know, because you are the leader of Tivo Method, how you foresee that future growth trajectory um, and you have an action plan. And you know, you mentioned you have um, specifics in mind, such as the 500 student volunteer collaborations online, and then obviously being online, creating that innovative IT, you know, digitized platform for students to actually engage. Um, and then I think what really resonated with us here at Higher Words is that you mentioned you definitely want to connect with Silicon Valley companies who want to provide those financial resources, that capital um, to kind of kickstart and um, provide that you know, one of a kind platform to as many people as possible. And I think um, we really resonate with the fact that you're trying to build the stable model, um, you know, the stable model with your nonprofit because we are entering a new era. Um, things may not look the same ever again. We don't ever know. Um, we, all, we do know that student learning will be different uh, for the foreseeable future. And um, it's important to build more initiatives that are sustainable. And you know, Tiva Method is one of the nonprofits leading the charge with that. And um, we are definitely here to you know encourage you, empower you with our services that give that two percent cash back and that access to unrestricted funds that oftentimes you know a lot of nonprofits may not have at their disposal. So I think that um, the work that both of us are doing is honestly truly empowering. And I think we speak your language too. We speak your language of creating student leaders, building them up, allowing them to pursue their passions, and empowering them. Um, because the word empowering is literally in our mission. It's in, written everywhere on our website. Every, every single thing you learn about higher rewards is about empowering others. And every single thing you learn about Tivo Method is also about empowering and uplifting others. So thank you so much, uh, Paul, for coming on and sharing your time with us. Have we truly appreciated learning more about Tivo Method and the amazing work you're doing to kind of build a more holistic educational experience for students who wish to pursue um, their, you know, passion projects uh, with guidance, with mentorship, and with degrees of success. Um, for now, we're just going to transition to a brief question and answer session. Uh, so if you have a question for Paul, I'll just ask that you use the hand raising button on Zoom, and then you can come on live to ask your question. So with that being said, are there any questions? Okay, so it looks like we have a question from Jacob Pip. So Jacob, feel free to come on live and ask your question. Hey Paul, incredible, incredible work. I'm sitting here in the background smiling the whole time. So, um, so many things I would like to actually talk with. I resonate with your, uh, your story um, and I won't get into that obviously, um, but I was just kind of sitting here thinking about um, taking principles of your method to um, into like the higher education, I know that um, you know, put more emphasis on interest uh, in these passion projects, like you call them. Um, and I, 
uh, I know that uh, at least in, in college, right, people drop out in the first year because we're just always taught to get your GE, you know, your general education stuff out of the way and you're not doing anything that uh, is, is your passion or interested about. So um, I was just thinking I'd love to see the word elective uh, like rebranded into some of the language that you use uh, as interests or uh, passion projects or something. Do you ever see, um, I'll get to my question now, I guess. Um, do you ever see general education kind of taking a back seat to more of these um, interesting and, and passion projects as you, as you see, as you call them? Are you, uh, are you referring to college or to general education like K-12? I, 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 I'm really thinking more, I guess, along the, the college level. I, I know that what you guys are doing is teaching these, the, the general ed through these passion projects. So I'm just wondering if that language uh, would stick. And, and I guess moving forward, have, have you seen people um, go through your program and then go through uh, high school and college as well? Um, so no, not we, we are our kids are out until like sixth grade for the ones that have been with us longer. Um, we haven't seen anyone go to college, although some of them like they could be in college already. Uh, they're yeah. <laughs> really high level stuff. Um, but um, I, I guess I would I would approach your question maybe like from two spectrums, the you know extreme and then not so extreme. The not so extreme would be. By the time you're in college, you have a really, really good take on um, kind of what makes you tick. Now, it might still be kind of a feeling or an emotion, not necessarily a thought, but you know what you like. Um, the thing I think that holds a lot of college students back is worrying that what they like will not satisfy the expectations of society, parents, peers, et cetera, uh, culture in general. Um, so one, one thing I think colleges could do uh, to kind of bring passion projects in without having to revolutionize college would be to outlay at the beginning of the semester or the quarter what the learning objectives are and then let students come up with projects that they could work on over the course of that semester or quarter that could satisfy those learning objectives. And then this would give students a little bit more control, which is one of the big components of passion and formally intrinsic motivation is having control over your learning. Um, so I think it would satisfy that and then give students more autonomy to make mistakes and learn um, through um, uh, learning styles that are more natural to how they are. So some might want to present, others might want to build out. Um, and I think that when you give some, when you give a person access to the ways that they learn naturally, um, they do deeper learning and retain more and the learning's more meaningful, so they're more likely to use that. So that's kind of where I would start on the, the less extreme side. And then on the more extreme side, um, I research geniuses and breakthrough innovators, um, people that you've heard of, people you've never heard of. Mike Kunda is one of my favorite. He is a Rocky impersonator from the movie Rocky. Um, he has the, one of the most successful tour companies in Philadelphia. He brings you on the Rocky tour and he's been impersonating Rocky since he was like seven, um, but never knew that it could turn into a job. Yet when I, well, I through my research, I um, counted like more than 50 or 60 skills he had accumulated over those years. He could have been doing Rocky tours 20 years earlier. Um, so, so, but he's a happy, successful guy now. And most people though, like Bill Gates or Michael Dell, a lot of those people have uh, basically economic valuable skills, economically valuable skills between the age of 14 and 18. And part of the reason why they're already ready to enter the workforce and innovate in the workforce is from earlier ages, four, five, six years old, they found what they were passionate about and they continually scaffolded those skills. So by the time they were 15, 16, 17 years old, they had a decade of learning um, under them and were more skilled than most kids are who are taking more general education classes. So 
On the extreme end, I would say that, you know, by the time you're in college, it would be a great idea to throw out the general ed requirements and to sit down with students and say, okay, what are you good at? What aren't you good at? You know, doing more um, strength inventories, um, interest inventories, um, and then customize uh, courses. Now, this is not something new. Um, interdisciplinary degrees are really common. They're just not really popular. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you can do it, um, but uh, it's not a very popular route, and it, it does get complicated when you take into consideration all of the, 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 the course requirements. But one last thing I want to throw out. I don't see a lot of it at, at school level, innovation or just practical skills. So um, no matter what you do, students should be interacting more with the real world through their learning. There needs to be more of that in college and K-12. Um, by having a girl research the Humane Society, she's learning about things in the real world and how her learning, um, how it's a dynamic process. And it's not a straight, it's not as straightforward as remembering and, um, and then taking test, right? Or doing a project and getting a good grade on it. Um, you run into tons of obstacles in the real world that are unforeseeable, that are, um, uh, that are uh, uh, vicarious, that are ambiguous. And so learning how to deal with, uh, with uncertainty in the real world by actually basing learning on the real world, I think is one of the most valuable things that a student can learn in school. And so I would just say in general, college could emphasize um, more real world connections um, for the students. I, I totally agree. I absolutely love your thought process here and uh, excellent work. Really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Great question. Okay, well, thank you so much for um, answering that as well as just um, telling us so much more about your inspiring and amazing work that you're doing at the Tebow Method. And um, once again, we would like to thank you so much for doing this, Paul, and thank you, Jake, for the insightful question. Throughout our conversation um, and the question and answer session that we just had, we have seen how significant the work of the Tebow Method ha it has been and is currently also doing for improving the educational experience of all children through their own passions or interests. We appreciate everyone for tuning in, and you can also follow the amazing work of Paul and his nonprofit at tebowmethod.org or on Instagram at tebowmethod. Finally, Higher Words is all about sharing stories and empowering communities and individuals who have been dedicating their lives to others. If you wish to learn more about Higher Words and the way that we financially empower community-focused organizations, please, please visit higherwords.com or follow us on social media at Higher Words. For now, we hope you are all staying well and safe, and we hope to see you soon for a future installment of the speaker series. Thank you.